Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Turning your Bibles to Psalm 112. So we continue in summer in the Psalms. And we're looking today at a Psalm that's not as well known as a lot of the Psalms that we've looked at in this series, but an incredibly beautiful, powerful Psalm. It's a wisdom Psalm. It's about uh, the good life. Uh, but the good life according to God is very different from the good life according to the world, as we'll see as we dig into this this morning. So let's look at it together. Psalm 112, and I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, we'll look at the psalm from beginning to end. So let's begin together here in verse 1. Hallelujah. Happy is the person who fears the Lord, taking great delight in his commands. His descendants will be powerful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, compassionate, and righteous. Good will come to the one who lends generously and conducts his business fairly. He will never be shaken. The righteous one will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. His heart is assured. He will not fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. He distributes freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. The wicked one will see it and be angry. He will gnash his teeth in despair. The desire of the wicked leads to ruin. Let's pray. Father, as we prepare to dig into your word right now, we, we pray that your spirit would rivet our attention upon you. Lord, that we would listen well to the voice of your spirit. We, we know that your word is the sword of the spirit and that it penetrates into our lives and it does surgery in our lives and that it convicts and that it challenges and that it, that it heals and does all kinds of wonderful things. And so we pray now that you would give us the grace n not to be distracted by anything that happened before the service or that's coming after the service or this week. Lord, we need you and we need you right now and we need your word. And we pray that by your spirit, you would open the eyes of our hearts to behold wonderful things in your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we began the series by looking at Psalm 1, which was a wisdom psalm. And if you were here for that, or if you know Psalm 1, you know that it's basically about coming to a, a fork in the road in life. You know, Yogi Berra once said, if, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, right? But it depends on what, what, what road are you taking? That's what Psalm 1 is, is all about. You, you come to a place where two roads, two paths radically diverge and the choice that you make at that point to go God's way or to go your own way is going to produce two very radically different sets of results and two radically different destinies in the end. Psalm 112 is a lot like that. It's, it's another wisdom psalm. And Psalm 112 really, it, it gives us a vision of the good life, but the good life according to God is very different from the good life according to the world. Growing up in the 70s and, and 80s, kind of as part of the, the TV generation, uh, the commercials that we saw on TV, the sitcoms, most of them that we saw on TV, kind of presented a vision of the good life. That, that phrase, the good life, became kind of popular during that era. But the vision of the good life that you saw there on your TV screen was kind of all about, you know, material uh, wealth. It was kind of all about a life of ease and luxury and comfort. Unfortunately, much of modern uh, evangelicalism, rather than presenting the biblical alternative to that, has sort of aped what the world was saying. Instead of 
presenting a vision of life that's biblical and, and, and distinctive and different from the world, there was a whole false theology that was invented to, to basically go along with the world. The health and wealth gospel, prosperity theology, uh, promoted kind of you know, by people like you know, Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and uh, Joyce Meyer and Paula White and Joel Osteen and the list goes on and on. Um, basically was a theology that was invented to support our greed and our materialism. And un unfortunately, even in a lot of churches that would not be considered really part of the camp of health and wealth um, theology, basically what you have is kind of health and wealth theology light. <laughs> because in, in the, the teaching and the preaching that goes, that goes on there, um, there's very little about the, about the cross of Christ, very little about you know, the blood of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, the glories of the resurrection. Uh, it's not centered really on the gospel. There's very little about denying yourself, very little about sin, very little about sacrifice, very little about missions. It's kind of all about you know, boosting your own church's uh, numbers and, and that kind of thing, building kind of you know, your own kingdom and basically presenting a vision of how to have a comfortable, middle-class American life with a little bit of God thrown in to make yourself feel better. That is not the good life according to the Bible. Now, the good life, according to scripture, is about humbling yourself before God. It's about walking in humility and in reverence before him. It is about the deep development of godly character so that the choices that we make in life will flow out of that. Now, are there blessings that come with that? Absolutely. Not only eternally, but even in this life. And this psalm tells us about it. And they are infinitely better than anything that could, could be promised by prosperity theology. So what do we see here in Psalm 112? First of all, we see something about happiness and holiness. Happiness and holiness. We all yearn to be happy. God built that into us. There's nothing wrong with that. It's what, the way that we're wired. The problem comes when we see happiness as the opposite of holiness, which most people do. They say, well, you can either be holy or you can be happy. The Bible says something very different from that. The Bible says that true happiness is found in holiness. Psalm 16 and verse 11 David says here, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so fullness of joy is not found in veering away from God. Fullness of joy is found in drawing near to God which is exactly what we see in verse 1 of Psalm 112. Hallelujah. Happy is the person who fears the Lord. Now, I mentioned that this is a wisdom psalm, and God has actually give us, given us a whole book of the Bible that's filled with wisdom, right? The book of Proverbs. And Proverbs is based on a foundational verse that you see in the first chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs 1-7, which says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what does the psalmist say here in verse one? Happy is the person who fears the Lord. Fearing God for the believer is, does not mean cowering in terror of God. A after all, if you're in Christ, you have been adopted by the Father as a, as a beloved son or daughter. 
It means that the Father loves you with a perfect love so much greater, infinitely greater than even the best human parent could ever love you with because he's a perfect father. And so we, as, we don't cower in terror. Um, he's, our, he's our father. He, he, he loves us. But what we must do is walk in reverence and awe before him. It, it, it means that we delight in his commands. It means that we love him. We love him because he first loved us. And it means that we desire to obey him. We desire to do his will. We desire to follow his commands. We don't always do it perfectly, but the desire of our heart is to do that. But how do we know what his commands are? How do we know what God is like? How do we know his will, his way, his character, his promises? We know all of that through his word. And so the second part of verse 1 says that we're taking great delight in his commands. The only way that we can know his commands and thus take delight in his commands is to know the scriptures. It is impossible to love God and to walk with him without loving the scriptures and immersing yourself in the scriptures. Soak yourself in the Bible. And in order to do that, you are gonna have to make hard choices and turn away from some other things because you cannot soak yourself in the Bible and soak yourself in social media. You cannot soak yourself in the Bible and soak yourself in a screen, whether it's a TV screen or internet cruising or whatever. It means making choices to turn away from all of that and immerse yourself in the word of God so that you know what God is like and you know his commands and you delight in his commands and you've got a clear vision for navigating through life. Just over 50 years ago, in April of 1970, Apollo 13 blasted off. It was our third mission to the moon. Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 had both gone to the moon the year before in 1969. And so when Apollo 13 took off on April 11th of 1970, the American public had kind of grown complacent about the space program. I mean, we had already been to the moon twice. This was the third trip. And so when the astronauts took off, it was news, but it was kind of ho-hum news. But that was about to change. Because two days into the mission, there was a catastrophic mechanical computer failure. And at that point, the question became, not are we going to get to the moon? The question became, how are these guys going to get back? The computers have failed. How would they navigate their way back to earth? They did it by going old school. (laughs) What they did have was an objective point of reference outside of themselves, outside of the spacecraft, and that was the earth itself. We have, as believers, an objective, truthful point of reference outside of ourselves to help us navigate clearly through life. It's the scriptures. It it means that instead of doing life by our own intuition, our own whims, our own subjective opinions and feelings. It means that we have a truthful, objective point of reference outside of us to show us the way to go, to show us right and wrong, what's moral and immoral, what's true and what's error doctrinally. We must navigate by the word of God. You will hear the word of God preached and taught from this pulpit, but you must be proactive and take the initiative in your own life to immerse yourself in the scriptures. 
And you must make the choices that go along with that that will enable you to immerse yourself in the scriptures. Happiness and holiness. Second, blessings and obedience. Blessings and obedience. Let's look at verses two and three. His descendants will be powerful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Now again, this sounds very much like Proverbs. I did a series on Proverbs. If you want to go back and listen to that again, all the sermons are archived and you can go back and get it from the website or the the podcast or the app or whatever. Um, But one of the things that we talked about when we went through Proverbs was that when you see these, these sayings in Proverbs and these verses in verses two and three are exactly like Proverbs. So the interpretive principle here is that when we see these sayings, this is not to be read as like a quid pro quo. In other words, if I do this, then God does this. And so when you look at a verse like verse two, this is not you know, sort of a, a, a blanket statement that if you are godly parents, that your kids are guaranteed to be godly. What it is, is a general truth that if you raise your children in the training and instruction of the Lord and you model that for them, you walk the talk, there is a very, very, very high likelihood that they will walk in the way of the Lord and that they will pass the faith on to their children and the entire trajectory of a family changes. Verse 3 is not a blanket guarantee, you know, that if you follow God, you're going to have wealth and riches. Actually, by the standards of biblical times and by the standards of most of the world today, we already have wealth and riches, material wealth and riches as Americans. But by, by any standard, this is not like a blanket guarantee of material wealth. Now, the greatest wealth and riches are not material anyway. They're, 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 they're spiritual. N- nevertheless, th- there is a general truth that if we manage the resources that God gives us, God's way, if we steward those resources in a godly way, God will bless that. He will honor that. It sounds very much, verse 3, very much like the things that we read, you know, for instance, in, in, uh, in um in, in Proverbs, Proverbs 11, let's look, for, let's look first of all, though, at, um, at, verse, at verse 8, at verse 5, Psalm 125, good will come to the one who lends generously and conducts his business fairly. Again, very much like Proverbs 11. One person gives freely, yet gains more. Another withholds what is right only to become poor. A generous person will be enriched, and the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. Now you see this principle in the teaching of Jesus. Luke 6 and verse 38, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with a measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Paul says something very similar in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. So we, we think that if we hold on to more, <laughs> we will have more. The irony of what God's word teaches is that when we open up our hands to give, that the cause of God might go forth. When we open up our hands to give, that we're also opening up our hands and our lives to receive God's blessing. God will take care of his own. Blessings and obedience. Third, trust and confidence. Trust and confidence. Verse four, light shines in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, compassionate, and righteous. What is so encouraging here is that what God's word is telling us 
is that the circumstances of our lives don't have to be going right. Everything doesn't have to be breaking our way in order for us to walk in the light of the Lord and to have his joy. Because what does verse four tell us here? Light shines in the darkness for the upright. Even in the darkest times, we can walk in the light of his love. It's very much like Psalm 23 and verse four, which says, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The promise is not that, that we will be able to avoid trials and tribulations and valleys and dark times in our lives. That's not the promise. The promise is that when we go through those times, we do not walk alone. There's one who will never leave you nor forsake you. And he is the one who possesses all the power in the universe. Tim Keller tells about a, a college retreat that he was on one time. And, and the woman who was leading this particular session referred to Hebrews 1.3, which says that Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. Christ upholds the, the universe by the word of his power. So she said, uh, you know, the, the, the distance between the earth and the nearest star is 93 million miles. Well, imagine if that distance were represented by the thickness of a sheet of paper. Then the distance between the earth and the nearest, uh, the nearest star would be a stack of paper uh, 70 feet high. But if you think about the diameter of the galaxy that we live in, the Milky Way galaxy, and you use the same dimensions, that would be a stack of paper 310 miles high. And yet, the Bible says that Christ upholds the whole universe, and our galaxy is just a speck of dust in the universe. But Christ upholds the whole universe by the word of his power. Now the one who does that is the one who also upholds you. <laughs> the one who walks with you. And, and, and so therefore the issue is not what's kind of happening in our lives at the moment. The issue is who he is. Who God is. Who the God is who is walking with you. Look at verses six and seven. He will never be shaken. The righteous one will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. Most of us know what it's like to be shaken. Most of us know what it's what like to, 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 to receive news suddenly that's like an earthquake in our lives. The conversation with the doctor that we didn't want to have and hearing, hearing the news that a biopsy or a test has, has come back in a, in a way that turns our whole life upside down in an instant. The phone call in the middle of the night that we never wanted to have but that comes. The text message or the email or the phone call from someone that we thought we could trust that just guts us. And, and life is shattered and you're shaken, shaken to the core. And, and it's easy when we have walked through times like that to be shell-shocked and to begin to walk through life in fear fearing bad news, fearing you know, what hammer is going to drop next in life. The Bible never minimizes or denies the pain and the trials and the darkness that we can walk through in this fallen world. The Bible also doesn't say that, that, that as believers, we are going to be able to do life in a bubble and walk through life kind of somehow insulated from, from trials and problems and pain. The Bible never teaches that. 
the question is not whether we will go through such times. The question is how we deal with it when we walk through such times. And this is where two things come into play. And both of them begin with T. Your theology and your trust in God. First of all, your theology. What you know about God. And again, this comes from the scripture. When you steep yourself in the word of God and you understand God's character and you understand things like God's sovereignty and God's faithfulness, God's promises, and God's steadfast love, when you understand that, then you've got a well of resources to draw from in hard times, and, and the root, your roots go down deep into the soil so that you're not easily blown over. That's your theology, that's what you know about God, and it comes from the scriptures. But the second T is your trust in God, because you can know the right things about him in your head, but yet, you haven't personally trusted him with your heart. It's one thing to kind of know intellectually about things like God's sovereignty and and God's steadfast love and kind of to believe the right things about him, but do you know him? Do you know the one who is sovereign? Do you know personally his steadfast love? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Is there an authentic relationship with him? Have you trusted him? Do you trust him on an ongoing basis with every issue in life, right? Those two things. Your theology and your trust. And I want to invite you to trust him today. And that begins... That begins with, with, with one d- choice that everything else flows from. We're talking about wisdom today. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that Christ has become for us wisdom from God. And righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ has become for us wisdom from God. Our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. In order to have wisdom from God, we must know the Son of God. We must know Christ. Christ has become wisdom from God. You know what? We talk about choices in life. There's only one who made every right choice. There is only one who walked through life unerringly, making every right choice as he walked through life Only one who lived the perfect life in our place that we could never live and who died in our place, the death that we could never die, a vicarious death for sinners because he had no sin of his own. There is only one who rose from the dead and defeated death for all who will trust in him, and that is Christ. Turn to Jesus and trust in him. That's step number one. Everything follows from that. When we know him, it becomes a process of growth in him. Are we going to build our lives after the pattern of the world? Or are we going to build our lives upon the wisdom of God that we find in his word? And Christian, that involves choices that we make every day. And the way that we use our lives and the way that we use our time. Let's pray together. Father, we, we pray that as we think about a godly life, the, which is the good life, and we think about uh, walking wisely, Father, we pray for anyone in the hearing of this message who doesn't know Christ, because Christ has become for us wisdom from God. There is no coming to you without your son. And so, Father, I pray for anyone who's listening to this message here in this room or who's watching this message at some point later on, I pray for anyone who doesn't know Jesus. 
I pray that by the power of your spirit right now that you would enable them to open their hearts, that you would open their hearts sovereignly to respond to the good news of the gospel, that there is one who walked a life of perfect wisdom, lived the perfect life we could never live, died in our place, died for our sins because he had no sin of his own so that we can be forgiven and so that we can have new life. There is one who was raised from the dead so that we can have eternal life. Only one defeated death. And Father, I pray that right now, anyone who doesn't know Christ would would turn to him in repentance and in faith. And for those of us who do know him, Lord, we pray that you would do a deep work in our lives so that we would leverage our lives, everything that we are, our, our, our time, our energy, our resources, that we would use this one brief life that we have on this earth to be all out for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.